We, we are going to, this morning, talk about the man by the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. You can go ahead and find your way in your Bible to John chapter 5 if you want. The title of my message today is called Four Questions and a Miracle. Four Questions and a Miracle. So John chapter 5 verse 2 says it like this. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And in each of these porches lay a great multitude of sick people. Great multitude. In the original Greek, that literally means there's a whole bunch of them. Okay? There's a whole bunch of sick people, blind people, lame people, and paralyzed people. And professional preachers would see this group of sick people and say, professional preachers would say, that's a needy congregation. Everybody's got a need. But what professional preachers don't understand is that every congregation is a needy congregation. And every one of us have a need, a place in our lives that we need for God to move. We, 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 all, have, we all have areas where God, we're begging Him to show up. The, th this past week, we laid out on a table all the cards you guys have been so good to to turn in for our Christmas services. We're praying for people to, to be saved and to get back into church. And the table, it was the coffee shop table, it was the, these cards were everywhere. And when, when I saw the need, it was overwhelming. I mean, it was just, it was sort of a breathtaking moment for me. And that's you praying for other people. I have the feeling that if we took up cards for you in this room it would be equally overwhelming we've all got needs professional preachers here at Bethesda in John chapter 5 would see a needy congregation but that's okay because Jesus specializes in needy congregations where there is need Jesus will be present if we will allow him to show up in our lives as a, as a matter of fact What's about to happen is Jesus is about to enter the scene. And as we ratchet up your expectation today, I, I need you to get this. He's in the room. I want you, if you could, in, in your spiritual eyes, to see him. You know, Elisha prayed for his servant. God opened his eyes. I want to pray for God to open your eyes. Do you see him? Find him in the room. Where is he sitting? Where is he sitting? You need to see him. He's here. He's here. They were blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Watch this. Verse 4 says, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped into the water first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of water whatever disease he had. Everybody say whatever. whatever. Whatever disease he had. Just a couple of things there. An angel stirs the water up and when people get into it, they're healed. The, the fire in the water did not begin here at Renaissance Church. It didn't. The miracles we've seen in our baptismal over the last year, so many people getting healed. It, it didn't start here. I've had, I've had people come to me Usually religious people would say, well, where's that at in the Bible? People getting into the water and being healed. First of all, shut up. People are being healed. Re 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 religion will try to shut miracles down, you know? Secondly, here's a scriptural basis for it if you need it. I found that miracles are always messy. Miracles are always going to shake up the formula of religion. The, the second thing I notice here is it says whatever diseases understand there is not a problem that you've got in your life so big that the problem solver can't step in and change it in an instant whatever everybody say whatever whatever you are facing let me say it again whatever 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 you are facing in your life the problem solver can change it in an instant whatever disease they had was healed now a certain man was there who had an infirmity, that means he's sick with something, for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. How long? 
38 years, a long time. And you think you've been waiting on your miracle a long time. Hadn't had a date in six months. That's okay. He waited 38 years for his miracle. He saw him in that condition. He'd been there a long time and he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him and said, sir, it's like he doesn't even know what Jesus' name is, right? Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am going, another steps down before me. And then Jesus says to him, rise. Everybody say rise. 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 Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, taking up his bed and walking. I, I want you to use the creativity every one of you have packed between your ears. You're all creative. And I want you to imagine John chapter 5 with me. I want you to imagine this pool called Bethesda. Uh, to help get you there, we've got a couple of, of pictures um, from archaeological digs of Bethesda. This is how Bethesda, the pool, looks today. So this is the first picture. This is actually the pool there. And then there is another picture that gives you sort of a more aerial view. So this is a real place. And it's where the miracle happens. I want you to imagine not only that you're there, but put yourself into the shoes of this man who has been sick, needed a miracle for 38 years. Nothing has worked. He has prayed. It hadn't worked. Religion hasn't worked. Medicine hasn't worked. But then he hears a rumor that there's fire in the water at this place called Bethesda. And he knows, I have to get to the water. Except, evidently, he can't walk, right? And there are no cars, so Uber is not going to come to the rescue and get him there. This means that your path to your miracle, if you're him, your path to your miracle is going to be a long journey. The path to your miracle could potentially be an excruciating journey. The path to your miracle, it, it, it may be a path where you've got to crawl to get to your miracle. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The path to your miracle may be a it gets me laughed at kind of path, but that's okay because something inside of you says take the path, take the journey to get to the place because I've got to get to the water. There's fire in the water. Finally, you arrive and you're here. You're here. But you look around and there are people everywhere and they are just as needy as you are. Let's be honest, some of them are a little more needy than you are. But you're here. And the water is troubled and the angel comes down and people jump into the water and they're being healed right before your eyes. You are seeing miracles. And everybody has so much hope. Look at what God is doing. What is giving, because you've been here for 38 years, what is giving everybody else hope is sucking the hope out of you because they're getting healed before you even have an opportunity to move an inch. They got family members throwing them in the water. And you begin to get angry. And a question four questions and a miracle, four questions and a miracle. A question teems to the surface of your spirit. God, where is my miracle? Let me say it like we say it. When am I going to get mine? Right, you know how we talk. 
That's great for them. But when am I going to get mine, God? You know, sometimes we suffer from miracle lust, don't we? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's miracle. We suffer, we suffer from miracle lust. It sounds like this. Why is God blessing his business but not my business? Why did God give her the raise but not me the raise? What, why is it that their, their child was restored and is back in church with my kids still out in the world? Why is it, why is it that this man in John chapter 5 gets healed by Jesus, but nobody else but Jesus gets healed that day? Right? See, see, we know the Bible tells us everybody else is getting healed, and it's not fair. But then Jesus, the Son of God, the SOG shows up, and he heals one person. I'm, I say he heals one person because usually when Jesus heals more than one person, the Bible tells us. It'll say things like, and he healed all the sick that were there. Or Jesus had compassion on all of them. It doesn't say that here. We get the detail that he heals one person. And if my conclusion bothers you, I can also show you other places in the scripture where Jesus, who is a miracle-making machine, walks by sick people and Jesus doesn't heal them. You know, what we're really asking when we say, where's my miracle? What we're really asking is, what's so good about them? What's so good about this man in John chapter 5? that Jesus only heals him. What's so good about him? What's so good about them? And if you were just there that day and you see this one man among a multitude, a whole bunch of people get healed, you might be thinking, what's so good about him? But here's what you're missing. Let me teach you about miracles real quick. You might want to write this down. What you are missing is this man's miracle did not come cheap. Write this down. My miracle will not come cheap. Miracles don't come cheap. That's what makes the miracle a miracle. If a miracle came easy, it wouldn't be a miracle anymore. It'd be just a way of life. His miracle did not come cheap. Remember, he had to crawl here. He couldn't Uber here. He's been waiting for 38 years. His miracle did not come cheap. Help me to preach this message and look at the person next to you and tell them, this didn't come cheap. Tell them that. This did not come cheap. This, all that God has done in my life, did not come easy. Oh, no, 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 believe me. This did not come cheap. The great marriage that you think I've got did not come cheap. I've got days and weeks sleeping on the couch to prove it. My good health did not come cheap. I've got medical bills and time spent in the hospital to prove it. The revival that this church is experiencing right now. Listen, I've got the as the pastor of this church, I've got the scars on my spirit to prove none of this came cheap. What God has done in your life just didn't. Is there anybody who can testify and say, I went through a hard time and God showed up and it was great, but it didn't come cheap. It wasn't easy. <laughs> Miracles don't come cheap and they don't come on time. At least not on our time, right? There's an old song that says he's an on-time God, right? I'd like to meet the guy who wrote that, okay? I've got a bone to pick. No, no. He's been waiting for 38 years, you all. For 38 years he's been waiting. Write this down. My miracle will come when my miracle is ripe to harvest. God is waiting on the ripeness of time to give you your miracle. God is waiting on the perfection of your character to give you your miracle. Understand, God cares more about your character than God cares about your miracle. God, 
God cares more about your eternal character than God cares about your temporary discomfort. Your miracle is waiting on the rightness of time and the perfection of your character and the passage of this winter season of your soul into the spring season of your soul. Miracles take time. This is what makes them miraculous. If you could conjure a miracle, it wouldn't be a miracle. It would be a uicle. Just made that up, trademark. If you saw that man and questioned it, what you would be missing is that miracles don't come cheap. For those of you, listen, for those of you who are in the waiting right now, I want you to hear this. The Spirit of God says you're paying the price. I'm perfecting your character. I'm making you the best version of you. Look how much better a person you are now. When you wait for 38 years, though, you start asking questions. The first question is, where's mine at? The second question is, what's wrong with me? Right? Because something must be wrong with me. If, if everybody else is getting theirs and I'm not, and it's not God, it must be me. Something I'm doing must not be working. So what's wrong with me? So what do I need to change about me to get my miracle? And, and so we, we start thinking, maybe I'm not a good enough person. Or usually what we think is, Maybe, especially in the context of miracles, maybe I don't have enough faith. And so what we try to do is we try to front and act super saved and turn ourselves into super faith Christian people. On the outside saying things like, I don't have a shred of doubt inside of me. I believe God will heal me. I believe it. Well, we say on the outside, but on the inside, let's be honest. On the inside, we all have moments where we're scared two-year-old children. On the inside, we all have doubts. Some of you, in the name of Jesus, I need to lift this burden off of you. The miracle is not about how big your faith can be. Stop trying, you've got to, stop trying to think you've got to fake yourself, I mean faith yourself into your miracle. Because it's not about how much faith you can conjure. Jesus didn't talk about how big faith could be. Jesus talked about how little faith could be and still get the job done. Jesus said, faith the size of a little mustard seed can move a mountain. And so the devil will talk to you in the language of how big your doubts are. But Jesus says, I'll top you, devil. I'll take the smallest shred of faith I can find in a person and I'll move a mountain out of their life for them. That's what God does. He takes the smallest shred of faith the smallest seed of faith he can find in the winter of your soul. God wants to know, do you have a seed left? I know you've been beaten down in this season, but do you have a seed left? Can you, can you muster a seed? God will take the smallest seed of faith that he can find in the winter season of your soul and get you into the spring season, and God will harvest that seed into a mighty oak tree. I prophesy to you that the oak tree is coming. All you need is a seed. All you need is a seed. All you need is a seed. When we do our altar call today, we do our altar call today bring your doubts just bring a seed with it the smallest seed smallest seed Here, let me give you a new definition of faith okay here's a new I think biblical definition of faith the faith definition is that faith is the elevation of action over doubt Faith is elevating action over your doubt. A couple of weeks ago when we did our legacy offering, I promise you, Kelly and I, when we brought our check, it was a, it was a sacrificing kind of check, as many of you also wrote and turned in. 
I promise you, when we wrote that check, we had doubt. But we also wrote the check. An elevated action over doubt. That's faith. Right? I promise you, this man in John chapter 5 has got doubts aplenty. He doesn't even know Jesus' name. Jesus, the Son of God, steps to him, and the man is like, Sir, sir, who are you talking This is Jesus. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. This complete stranger finds this man who has been, been like this for 38 years and says, Stand up, sucker. I promise you, he had doubt. In another place, Jesus heals a man, and the man before Jesus heals him said, I believe, but help my unbelief. In other words, I've got doubts. He is so good to us that he will deliver the miraculous to us in the middle of our doubts. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the presence of action in the middle of your doubt. And so Jesus says, just stand up. I know you've got doubts, but do you have a seed that can propel you to just stand up? Real faith will compel you to action. Just stand up. James chapter 2 does not say faith without doubt is dead. It says faith without works is dead. Your faith will, even a little mustard seed, will compel you to just stand, rise, take up your bed and walk. When we do the altar call today, and it's time to pray, do something about the seed that's inside of you. Step forward, bring your doubts. Bring your doubts, it's okay. And see what God does. I find it really interesting that we don't really know what's wrong with this man. Remember the verse says he has that infirmity, right? In the original Greek, that means something's wrong with him. Something ain't working like it's supposed to, right? Something's broke inside him. But we don't know what's wrong with him. Interestingly, we are specifically told what's wrong with everybody else that's there. We'll try to get this verse back on the screen for you. Remember, the Bible said there was a multitude of people there. They were blind, they were lame, and they are paralyzed. We are specifically told what's wrong with them. But the main, the main character of the story, the man whose healing we've been celebrating this morning, all we know is he has an infirmity. Something's wrong with him. We don't, we don't, as my grandma used to say, he's got a hitch in his giddy up, you know? We don't know what's wrong with him. I find this word infirmity. Everybody say infirmity. Infirmity, very interesting. I'm gonna teach you some stuff here, okay? For those of you who like deep teaching, we're about to get deep because this word infirmity has to date only been used one other time in the New Testament. I've done the research for you. Let me tell you where it is. It's in Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, the Bible says that there is an old woman who is bent over at the waist and she cannot stand up. The man in John chapter 5 is told to stand up. This woman can't stand up. And the Bible tells us that this woman whose body has been warped by sickness has a medical diagnosis of arthritis. So the doctors have said, lady, you've got arthritis. But when Jesus comes into the room, Jesus looks at her and says that she has a spirit of, guess what the word is? Infirmity. And so Jesus says, unclean spirit, leave this woman. And she's healed. Jesus mm, did not, this is so good. Jesus did not speak to her medical diagnosis. Jesus spoke to her spiritual status. I have asked some hard questions already. Here's a third hard question. It's the hardest question of the morning. It's okay, the fourth question is the easiest and it's the best. But the third question is this. Could this be a spirit of infirmity? I think that's what's going on in John chapter 5. It's the same word. And we're not even really told what's wrong with him. There's something wrong and the doctors can't put their finger on it maybe. We're not told specifically what it is. In other places in the scripture, 
Jesus has little children come to him. And the little children may have maybe deaf, and, but Jesus doesn't speak to the deafness. Jesus says, evil spirit, come out of this child and they're healed. To a lame man one time, Jesus says, evil spirit, come out of him and he can walk. Could this be a spirit of infirmity? Now listen, I am not saying you are demon possessed, okay? But I do wonder if maybe you are demon attacked. Demon oppressed. C.S. Lewis once said, we are not primarily a body with a spirit. He said, we are primarily a spirit with a body. And, and so whatever it is that is attacking your body, mind, or, or, or your physical body, it could just be physical. It could just be that. It could just be spiritual. Or it could be both. As what happens in the spirit often informs what happens in the world we can see. When I called Jade forward to be healed, I think she said 36, 37 days ago, and we were praying over her, I've told her this, in the spirit, we've got to learn to open our spiritual eyes, you all. In the spirit, I saw a black cloud rise up off of her. I saw it. And when I saw it, I knew something special has happened here. Could this be a spirit of infirmity? I've, I've written down, just indulge me for a second, because when you come up for prayer today, you're going to need to discern, is this that, or, or, or maybe it's not a spirit of infirmity, but you need to discern, okay? I've written down nine factors for you to consider in asking, could I be in the middle of a spiritual battle that's causing all of this, okay? So, number one, this might be a spirit of infirmity. If you suffer from a strange or statistically improbable diagnosis. Number two, this might be a spirit of infirmity if the doctors cannot figure it out. Number three, it might be a spirit of infirmity if the medicine or the surgery that should work isn't working. Number four, you are constantly battling many different kinds of sickness, sicknesses. Number five, unexplained, sudden, and chronic back, neck, or spine pain. See the woman in Luke 13, for example. Number six, unexplained depression that has no basis in the facts of your life. Number seven, depression that should have lifted keeps staying around. Number eight, you are unnaturally drained of energy. Finally, number nine, you remain in a constant state of trauma. Things are always going wrong around you. Listen to you all again. These are just factors, and I cannot emphasize this enough. This could just be physical. But it could also be spiritual. We are primarily spirits with bodies. Is this a spirit of infirmity? Finally, we come to the best question of the morning. Jesus looks at this man, and he says... Sir, he says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? This is the easiest question maybe anybody's ever been asked, except for Kelly when I asked her to marry me. This, this is a no-brainer. But the man does not respond with, duh, of course I want to be healed. I've been doing this for 38 years, the man responds, and we'll try to get this verse on the screen for you. The man responds and he says, Sir, I have no man to put me in the water. He's talking to Jesus who wants to heal him about what men can do. He's talking to God about what men can do. We gotta stop doing that, you know? Let me tell you, let me, let me translate this for you. Basically, he's, he's looking at God and God's saying, do you want to be healed? And, he, and, and the man is like, uh, could you go by CVS and pick my pills up? Listen, there's nothing wrong with what people can do. Medicine is amazing. Counseling and psychiatry, psychology, amazing. They are amazing tools. 
But there are some things in our lives that men can't lift off of us. There are some things that only the power of God can step in and change. And that's what I'm talking to you about. And that's what Jesus is trying to talk to this man in John chapter 5 about. But he's so in the mode of trying to do it on his own. Some of you got to come out of this. You've got to give it to God this morning. And so he says, sir. As I said, he doesn't even know Jesus' name. Sir, nobody will put me in the water. And he's basically asking Jesus, can you put me in the water? And Jesus looks around and says, sir, no, no. What I'm about to describe to you does not happen in the pages of Scripture. I can't prove that it happens. I'm using my imagination. If you don't like that, that's cool. When you start your own church, you can tell it your way, okay? But in my mind, what happens is Jesus begins to adjust his expectation. Sir, who are you talking to, sir? No. Allow me to introduce myself to you, Jesus says. Jesus says, you want somebody to get you to the water? But I am the water. Woo! As a matter of fact, I just brought the living water to you. Sir, no, 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 no. Allow me to introduce myself. My friends call me Jesus, but my official first name is Alpha. My official last name is Omega. That means Alpha, I was there when it all started, and Omega, I'll be there when it's all wrapping up. Sir, no, 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 let me give you my resume. I once made a mud pie and whoo, breathed into it and made a man. I once took a rock and put water in it and called it ocean. You want me to put you in the water? No, 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 Jack. I am the water. I just brought the water to you. I want you to stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stay in this moment. God is about to move. I want to ask my prayer team to come forward. <laughs> Listen. We're about to have a holy moment where the Spirit of God is going to move. Let's not ruin this moment by thinking about what's happening an hour from now. Stay here. There are people here who need healing, deliverance, a word of encouragement that need you to stay here and focus. Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus brought the water to him. You want me to take you to the water? But I am the water. I brought the water to you. As I was, as I saw that this past week, the Lord gave me a prophetic word for this church. And this is what the Lord said. The Lord said this, Renaissance Church, in the year 2022, the fire was in the water. Oh, yes. But the Lord said, Renaissance Church, in the year 2023, the fire will be in the air. The, the miracles are going airborne. And the Lord spoke to me. And the Lord, the Lord said, there will be fire still in the baptismal. There will be fire around your altars. But the fire in the air will travel into the parking lot to follow you. The fire in the air will meet you in the grocery store wait lines. The fire in the air will meet you on the ball field. The fire in the air will meet you wherever you go because I am in you wherever you go. We're going to take the water to them. There's fire in the air this morning. It's here. 